You're tuned in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, guiding your gridiron journey none other than your host, former NFL lineman Ross Tucker. Oh, oh yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a teaching tutorial Thursday, which means class is in session with Professor Greg Cosell, NFL Films University. You know him. You love him. So many of you tune in either for the live stream or here on the podcast or youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL to hear the great Greg Cosell. We'll go over Greg's thoughts on the defensive backs in the 2024 NFL draft today. As a reminder, you absolutely should be binge listening or binge watching the College Draft Podcast with Emery Hunt. He is fantastic. I thought, by the way, both John Fossil and Phil Sims were really, really good this week. I hope you guys enjoyed those conversations as much as I did. Greg, you can go back and you can binge, listen, or watch all of the Raw Sucker Football Podcasts every Thursday for the last couple months with Greg going over the different positions for the NFL draft. That's probably a must listen, must watch situation as well. If we have time, I will get to the winners for the week in terms of people that spread the word via social media or take advantage of a sponsor or make a YouTube comment a little bit later on in the show. If we have time, can't remember if I said or not that we're presented by DraftKings. We are. I love them. I love you. And I love the big show with Greg Cosell. The Big Show. All right, Greg. Well, I think traditionally, after talking about the O-line, we've gone over to the D-line over the last few years. But I like to keep our listeners and the people that check us out on YouTube, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL, like to keep them on their toes a little bit. So let's go to the back end. Let's go to the DBs. Plus, we talked about the D-line with Emery Hunt on the College Draft Podcast this week. And, of course, we'll talk to Greg about the D-line in a couple weeks. But rather than having them talk about the same position group the same week, Emery gave his thoughts on the D-line. Let's get some of Greg's thoughts on the defensive backs because, you know, when you talk to people about this draft, Greg, a lot of talk about the quarterback, a lot of talk about the offensive tackles, the wide receivers, maybe not as much on the corners, although there still are. As always, a number of corners expected to go in the first round of the draft. Was there a guy that sort of jumped out to you? It's interesting to me, Greg, in that before the season, the the guy everybody said was number one was Kool-Aid McKinstry. Right. And then most people, number two from Alabama, number two had Kalen King, the cornerback from Penn State. Well, now Kool-Aid McKinstry, you know, there's people that think there's several guys ahead of him. And Kalen King has really fallen off. So why don't we just start with the two Alabama guys that are both expected to be first-round picks? Yeah, uh, just as a an overall statement, I think this year is not viewed as a great corner class overall. Um, now, that doesn't mean corners won't be drafted because we know it's a premium position in the league. So corners will get drafted. But I'm not sure that anybody is looking at the corner position in this year and seeing that one guy or two guys where you go, wow, that's a really big-time prospect. Um, one could make the argument that Arnold is the best of the group as you project him to the league. Um, I would say that um, he's really, really good playing what we call mirror match press man. Um, and by that, I mean that he doesn't physically use his his arms or hands to to jam receivers off the ball. He simply waits for them to declare their um, initial route um, and, and their release, and then he just gets in their hip pocket. So he's got really quick, light, deceptively sudden feet and movement. He's got really smooth hips. Um, one of the things that showed up with him, and, and I think this is something that needs to be worked on, is... He did show some susceptibility and vulnerability at the top of the route stem. At times, he would lose contact with the receiver. Um, That was probably the number one thing that stood out as something that he has to work on. Um, But he's very controlled. He's very poised. He didn't really get 
out of phase as as we use the term um you know he he ran a 451 which is usually not considered great but he plays faster than that um and he's got pretty good size he's almost 6 feet so he's he would be considered i think the number one corner prospect um you know what's interesting he kind of came out of nowhere i mean he played the year before greg yeah. but he kind of rotated Whereas Kool-Aid McKinstry had been a multi-year starter and then Arnold, you know, had been considered inconsistent, feisty, uh, talented, but inconsistent. And then he really kind of took the ball, uh, the bull by the horns this year and played very, very well. Let's talk about Kool-Aid McKinstry, who obviously has an amazing name, uh, but he came <laughs> in and, and people talked about him as being... You know, maybe that guy, maybe that guy that is a top 10 type player. It it sounds like he didn't have that kind of season. What did you see when you checked out Kool-Aid on video? Yeah, I liked him on tape. Um, and I watched him last summer from 2022 as well. And of course, as you just indicated last summer, he was being talked about as a potential top 10 pick. Um, sometimes I always wonder how that changes because his traits certainly didn't change. Um you know, I think you're dealing with a guy that is is press man coverage is really the strength of his game. It's evident from studying his tape that he's a true cover corner. He's very comfortable matching up on the outside. Um, I think where he needs work and where he's not at his best is in off coverage. And he would get stuck at times. Um, so that's where he needs work. But he's a press man corner. Um, and, and just one quick point uh, that I, I, I felt like I should have made about Arnold. Arnold is a super competitive player on the edge. He's a really good tackler. He's physical and competitive, and that always means something to defensive coaches in the NFL. But I think McKinstry, getting back to him, I think he's a solid corner prospect. Um, I think he would transition best to a team that does feature man coverage as its foundation. It's not as if he can't play zone, but I think that he's most comfortable playing press playing man and that would play to his strengths so when you say in off coverage greg he gets stuck let's dive into that because people need to know what that means what do you mean he gets stuck in off coverage well what happens it means your feet sort of stop um, and you get a little sort of segmented in your reaction, that you're not as smooth and fluid with your hip turns, um, with your transitions, because um, your feet kind of get stuck. They stop. Um, and if that happens, then, you know, you lose your advantage. Then the receiver can basically separate at that point. Um, so that's true with a lot of these guys who um, play a lot of off coverage is they don't play it at a really high level. It's tougher for them to play it or else they turn their bodies too soon because they know that they, they sort of have to try to compensate for it. But uh, that, that's what I mean by getting stuck. They sort of stop their feet and that causes problems. You know, what I think is so interesting, Greg, and we talk about this a lot on the college draft podcast with Emery is, you know, we spend so much time stacking the players, evaluating the players, grading the players, et cetera. People say this guy's better than that guy or that guy's better than that guy. Just by hearing the way you describe it, Greg, it just feels like the style st is really important, right? Like if you're a D coordinator that wants to play a lot of press man, it sounds like maybe you'd favor Kool-Aid over Terry and Arnold, right? Because of the press. You like, might. You it, might. Doesn't think... it depend a lot on yeah. what kind of defense you want to play and how you want your corners to play, how you might stack these guys on your board? Yeah, and, and that's why, you know, there's so many variables, Ross. It's, you know, there's very few transcendent players. Like, for instance, there's no Patrick Sertan in this draft. You know, Patrick Sertan came out. You could even argue that draft had J.C. Horn. Two two corners that were better prospects in terms of their overall trades than any corner in this particular draft in 2024. They don't You don't have those guys. Now, obviously, Horn has been injured a lot and it hasn't worked out. And Sertan, some would 
argue is the best corner in the NFL right now. Um, but there's not one of those guys. So now you get into a lot of variables, and that's why this is not a mathematical equation. And it's very easy for a guy to go to a team, and for whatever reason it doesn't work out, and then people say, oh, well, you didn't evaluate him properly. Maybe. But the point is, is that so much of this depends on how they're deployed uh, within the team, how they're coached, because they all need coaching, as you know. Um, and so there are so many factors. But yeah, I mean, I really liked McKinstry as a press man corner. If I had to say who was better as a pure press man corner, I would say McKinstry. If I had to say who maybe was better as an overall corner, I might take Arnold. Let's talk about uh, some of these other guys, um, including, you know, it's not often that you have A, a senior, and B, a guy from the MAC. Yeah. That's considered a first round corner. I mean, Greg, not many corners that are first round caliber end up playing their senior year. And then certainly you don't find many of them, especially in the NIL era, you don't find a lot of them in the Mac, but that's the case with Quinion Mitchell from Toledo. Yeah. And Mitchell's really athletically gifted. I mean, he's a good sized kid, almost looks like a running back at times, um, ran really, really well. Um, Played almost all off coverage. That's his thing. He played almost all off coverage. Um, and, you know, were there some snaps of press? Some. But he hardly played it. So now you have to decide, okay, how will he transition to the league? Because at some point he is going to have to play press. Now, I think he has the physical traits to do so, Ross. So it's not a case where he can't. He can't physically or athletically do it. I mean, he's over six feet. He's built incredibly well. He certainly can run. He ran a 4-3, and you see that on tape. I mean, he, he, he does not get lost at all when guys run vertically. He runs with them, and he plays the ball really well. Doesn't have a lot of picks, but he plays the ball really well at the catch point. That's a strength of his game. Um, so now you're dealing with a guy that can match up to the bigger receivers in the league, He's explosive as an athlete. Um, everything about his physical and athletic traits says high-level corner prospect. Um, now, playing off coverage all the time, he has explosive downhill plant and drive because that's what he played. You know, that's that's what he's used to playing. His physicality at the catch point um, with outstanding timing to get his hands on the ball and knock it out of receiver's hands really stood out on tape. Um, this guy really has traits. So now you have to decide the press man part and the level of competition part. So those are the two things that now you have to decide as you figure out where you want to draft them. Um, so much good stuff there. And by the way, I did watch Nate Wiggins. I, I, I so I, I, you know, he's a guy we should talk about. Got it. Okay, we'll get into Wiggins as well after I get into telling everybody how delicious Labatt Blue Light is. My favorite beer, light beer of all time. Make sure you're drinking Labatt Blue Lights this weekend. Maybe you're watching the Masters. Maybe you're just hanging out. Maybe you're starting grilling season, thanks to our friends at Good Ranchers. Drink some Labatt Blue Lights with your friends. Live life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly beer. Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. All right, you mentioned, Greg... Uh, Right before I told everybody about Labatt, you mentioned Andrew Wiggins or Nate Wiggins, I should say. Gosh, You're changing I got him sports on me there, uh, Ross. <laughs> yeah, I got I got him confused. Okay, we're with getting the basketball the player You're You're changing sports, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least you know that enough to say that joke. Uh, Nate Wiggins from Clemson. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious what you think of him. I've, I've seen some people say they think he's the best pure man guy. What have you seen? Yeah, maybe the most athletically gifted corner in in the draft. Um, he's got size. He's over six one. He's just he's he's one seventy three. So now you have to decide what that means. You know, that's the thing. It's 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 always easy, you know, to evaluate these guys to some degree. But then you have to decide, and each team sees it differently. So he's one seventy three, but he's got size. He's got length. He's got tremendous speed. I mean, tremendous speed, and that shows up on tape. I mean, he played physical press man. He played, you know, as I said, mirror match press man where you don't jam off the ball. Um, and there were times he got beaten off the line of scrimmage, by the way, 
but his outstanding accelerating speed allowed him to recover and make a play. So now the question is, is that going to happen in the NFL? I mean, he did run a 4 2 8. He's got tremendous speed. Um, you know, he also showed tremendous and explosive plant and drive closing speed from off coverage. Um, I mean, you're talking about a guy that has elite lateral and downhill burst. You know, this guy really is an explosive, explosive athlete. Now, there are things to be worked on, as there always are. He's he's too upright in his pedal and off coverage. Again, you're talking about fractions and milliseconds that make a difference, as you know, in the NFL, Ross. So all these things matter. Um, he's another guy that can be a little segmented, a little sticky and stiff um, when he transitions off his pedal, when he's in off coverage. So these are things you have to work on. But you're talking about a guy that is just an explosive athlete. Love it. Uh, you know, there's a couple other guys I want to ask you about, including Cooper DeGene. Greg, it's been 20 years, I think, since there's been a white cornerback in the NFL. And I think because of that, it's probably human nature. There's always going to be some skepticism, right? It's been a long time since we've seen a guy like that play that position. Uh, but, man, this guy has some explosive ability. What did you see from, from Cooper DeGene, the corner from Iowa? You know, I think it's going to be really interesting with him because there will be a lot of teams that will see him as a safety. He's he's a little stiff. Um, and that really shows up on tape. I mean, even when he plays press, I mean, he struggles a bit. Uh, it would not surprise me if teams see him in safety. In fact, I, I could easily make the argument that the corner from a year ago at Iowa, Riley Moss, who was drafted by Denver, maybe in the third round, if memory serves me correctly, was a better corner prospect than Cooper DeGene. Um, some might even see him as a big nickel safety. Some might see him as a star playing in the slot. Um, he's a physical kid. He's a competitive competitive kid. He's going to have a workout, I think, in a couple of days because he's been cleared. And my guess is he'll test really well. But there's just a stiffness to him that concerns you a little bit uh, when you see him as an outside corner. Interesting. Last guy, Rakestraw. Ennis Rakestraw from Missouri. Yeah, he was a really fun guy to watch because this guy... Again, he is super, super competitive. You love the way he plays. He's feisty. He plays with a swagger. Um, he's thin frame, but he never lets that get in the way of his approach and his physicality. Just like Arnold from Alabama, Rake Straw is a really feisty run defender. I mean, physically tough and competitive. Um, I think teams w could see him on the outside. They could see him in the slot because cause he is so competitive. Um I mean, he played press, he played off coverage, he's got the athletic traits to be successful in both techniques. Um, you know, he's only 183 and 5'11". As I said, that doesn't mean he can't play on the outside. Um, you know, his athletic testing numbers weren't as good as Denzel Ward's when Ward's was the fourth overall pick in the draft, but the size is almost exactly the same. Um, I really liked his tape a lot. I think that um, this... I think you can play him on the outside, and I'll be very curious to see where he goes and very curious to see, again, just like you said, comes down to how a team sees him, what their needs are, because he he had meaningful snaps in the slot at Missouri in addition to playing outside. Uh, what about the safety position, Greg? Was there any guy that, that really jumped out to you? It doesn't sound like people think they're well, there's two first guys, rounders. And again, I've not been through all of them. So, again, maybe there'll be somebody else I like as we continue. But I really like Tyler Newbin from Minnesota, and I really like Cole Bishop out of Utah. Tell me about tell me about Newbin. Newbin is one of those guys that he just had a great feel for reading routes, route concepts, route combinations, reading the quarterback at the same time. You know, that that is something I'm not sure you can teach that. I think he had an unbelievably innate feel for that. Um, just recognition of receiver splits, route concepts, and his concurrent ability to trigger with burst and speed, driving on routes in front of him, taking away throws. Um, you know, I think that's, yeah, that might be termed an instinct. You know, that's a word you hear a lot, and a lot of people don't, you know, define it. But he just had a really good feel for that. 
and I thought that he was um, really competitive and aggressive playing downhill as an alley defender and gap shooter in the run game. Um, Newbin's a really good prospect. Now, again, you know, he didn't run really, really well, but I, I think he played with really good range because he saw things so fast. And Bishop, Greg? Bishop, I really like. Bishop, uh, again, um, you know, I always, I'm I, I'm so leery of making comparisons these days, Ross, because that's all people remember, okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to stay away from that. <laughs> but I really like Cole Bishop's tape a lot. I mean, this guy has really, he's got a desirable combination of size, physicality, athleticism, played on the back end, played in the box, did everything for Utah. You can certainly play him as a post safety in cover one and cover three. You can play him as a split safety in cover two and all variations of cover four. Um, you know, he had a high football IQ. Um, there, There's a, a lot to like about Cole Bishop. I mean, he's size, movement, versatility, competitiveness, savvy, intelligence, Big-time communicator on the back end for Utah. Again, we don't know what he's doing, but you saw in almost every play, he's communicating with people, and that tells you something. Check him out on social media. He is the man. We love him. At Greg Cosell. We'll get to linebackers and D-line over the next couple weeks. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Ross. Anytime we talk with Greg, it is a meaty segment. It is a delicious, meaty, filled football sandwich, if you will. Well, why not get actual meat? Why not claim your $150 value of free wings plus an additional $20 off with my code ROSS at GoodRanchers.com today? They're the number one American meat delivery in the U.S., bringing 100% American beef Chicken, pork, wild-caught seafood to your door. The reality is you really don't know what you're getting from the meat when you go to the grocery store. Not the case with Good Ranchers. They take the ick out of chicken. How? Every piece comes from an NAE program. That means no antibiotics ever. That's what you got to love about Good Ranchers, right? Transparency. Amazing supporters of my show So just that, by the way, is a good enough reason to go support them and take the mystery out of all the meat you buy. Go to GoodRanchers.com, use my code ROSS to get your free wings for a year. Gosh, I love wings. I am a drum guy, Uh, by the way. I'll get into that with Jack. $20 off and free shipping today. GoodRanchers.com, code ROSS. Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. Tuck Steaks. All right, Ross, the Jaguars, they reached a long-term deal with franchise tag Josh Allen for $150 million over five years. That includes $88 million guaranteed. First of all, are you, a, are you a drums or a flats guy, Jack? I like both, but absolutely flats. Yeah, eh, wrong. That changes things for me and you. <laughs> That's the wrong answer. Uh, yes, Josh Allen. Uh, the other Josh Allen, the Jaguars Josh Allen, man, that's a lot of money. Almost $30 million a year. It's a little bit less than that. That's with incentives, but it's like $28 million per year. Good for him. You guys know I love when as many players as possible get as much financial security as possible from the damage they're doing to their bodies and the risks they're taking playing this game. Eagles, they will play the Packers in Brazil for their season opener on Friday night. And I had uh, Brandon Graham on the Ross Report. I'll get him on the show at some point, but the Ross Report, which is just the one-minute Eagles social media thing I do, at Ross Tucker NFL, asking him about that game. That's a juicy, juicy matchup to start the season for both those teams. Arrest warrants were issued for Chiefs wide receiver Rasheed Rice. Not good. It's not a good situation. Like eight counts of different charges. We'll see what ends up happening there. Peyton Manning's Omaha Productions agreed to a nine-year extension with ESPN. Man, good for him. Nine-year extension. That's a long time locking in the Manning cast. And the other thing I saw, Jack, uh, just before we started recording, the NFL is now approving a third helmet 
for each team. So it was only like, there was like a 10 year period where you couldn't even have a second helmet. And then two years ago, they let you have a second helmet. And then now already you can have a third helmet. And as like one of the world's foremost uniform experts, Jack, you must be so excited. I'll talk to you more about that on Monday's show. And I'll do the winners on Monday as well. Other than that, I think we're done here. Thanks for tuning in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also check out Even Money, Fantasy Feast, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network on Samsung TV+, Plus, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. Shout out myfrontpagestory.com. You're checking two boxes there. You're getting the best gift for a loved one, birthday, anniversary, Mother's Day you could ever get, and you're getting a signed, personalized autograph from me, guaranteed. Backofficeschedule.com, SteakhouseSports.com, HumanHeadNYC.com, Sportaculture, 